Well, good evening, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to explore the history and heritage of the United States Coast Guard surfman uniform. The birth of the Coast Guard in January of 1915 is often described as the merger of the US Revenue Cutter Service and the US Life Saving Service. In reality, it was more of a combination with the two services remaining distinct branches under the new US Coast Guard banner. In the early days of the new service, each branch, Life Saving and Cutter, also known as Seagoing, would continue to function much as they had in the past. Perhaps the most visible aspect of the slow merging process was the uniforms that Coast Guard enlisted personnel wore. Cuttermen wore a traditional naval style uniform, surfmen, a unique uniform authorized only for the life saving branch. The shake surfman uniform would last for decades and would be worn with great pride by the lifesavers. It would also be one of the eventual inspirations for the modern day Coast Guard uniform. When the new Coast Guard organization was formed, the life saving service was actually the slightly larger force numbering approximately 2,200 men staffing 273 boat stations. The Revenue Cutter Service consists of approximately 1,800 officers and men. The Life Saving Service was a uniform service, but not a military service. That changed instantly on January the 28th, 1915. However, the primary mission of the surfmen would remain unchanged. Rescuing those in peril on the sea would continue to be their ultimate focus. The transition to this new military Coast Guard would see station keepers promoted to warrant officer and senior surfmen to petty officer. Surf, surfmen now also became a military title and a pay grade for non-rated personnel similar to seamen or firemen in the Cutter branch. When the Coast Guard added Chief Petty Officer to the enlisted rate structure, many of the senior surfmen were promoted to chief. And some of the keepers would actually be changed to Chief Petty Officer billets, although it did not affect those already in the warrant officer grades. A unique life saving designation. Open parent, L, closed parent, was included in surfman's ratings. That is, Bozomate first class, L. As with their unique uniform, that L designation was a tremendous point of surfman pride, sometimes to the chagrin of their Cutterman counterparts. As with most uniform changes, the transition did not happen overnight. The easiest, most expedient, and thus the first uniform change for the service and the surfman was simply to replace the life saving service hat band with one reading US Coast Guard while continuing to wear the existing life saving service uniform. This slide shows the crew of Station Sturgeon Point, Alpena, Michigan, during these early transitional periods. Note that they are still wearing their surfman number and seal of the life-saving service on their upper sleeve. Remember this image, the fellows of Sturgeon Point, we will see the crew of this station later in the presentation. This image shows more clearly the US Coast Guard hat band on the cover of Surfman number two. To the right, we see the jovial crew of Station Bethany Beach. And then in the next step in the uniform transition, the tunic style uniform. Note that they are wearing the service stripes on their lower sleeves indicating years of service. This is one of the many things that would be carried forward in the modern Coast Guard uniform. We will also see these fellows later. The surfman cap and collar device. As time passed, a uniform more military and modern in its cut would be developed. 
The seal of the U.S. Life Saving Service, boat hook and pulling oar, centered in a life ring, would be the inspiration for a unique collar and lapel and cap device to be worn on the surfman uniform. The new device would be crossed oars top a life ring, honoring the heritage of the Life Saving Service and clearly identifying the surfman as a member of the Life Saving Plan. The surfman device like the uniform, would go through several refinements and traditions over, or transitions over time. For a few years, the device included the number of the specific station to which the surfman was assigned. The military nature of the Coast Guard required that surfman now move far more frequently between stations than in the days of the life-saving service. So the impracticality of including the station number quickly became evident and was removed. The collar device would later become the inspiration for the modern day surfman qualification badge. The surfman qualification is the highest level of professionalism for those operating Coast Guard small boats. Incredibly important and appropriate. World War I and the olive drab uniform. The onset of World War I brought significant changes for the surfmen of the Coast Guard stations, including the addition of an olive drab uniform, weapons qualifications, and a wartime security aspect to their traditional beach patrols. The World War I style olive drab uniform would be popular, but eventually phased out in the 1920s. This image shows a station crew in olive drab and surfmen conducting military drills in support of the captain of the port of the city of New York. The Coast Guard would be tasked with expanded port security responsibilities during the war. The personnel of nearby stations were the bulk of available shoreside personnel and were sometimes pressed into service to meet this, meet this new requirement. If you look at the photo on the left, you see that the, the officer in charge, the warrant officer, is front and center with his, uh, you know, 38 revolver, and he is he has donned the the warrant officer uh, device on his cap, but also has his surfman uh, collar devices. His crew all are in the U.S. Coast Guard Hatman style uniform, popular or essential with the with the olive drab uniform. This image shows the expanded version uh, that provides a better view of the U.S. Coast Guard hat band and the surfman collar device on the tunic style uniform from our folks from the New York area conducting military drill. This image shows our jovial friends from, the, from Station Bethany Beach now much more serious as they conduct weapons training. From tunic to tie, in addition to taking time, the service-wide uniform transition process was often very much unit or location specific and would take a tremendous amount. This was further complicated by a change in uniform styles after World War I, as all branches in the military moved from the traditional high collar tunic style uniform that had been popular in the early part of the 20th century, the various versions of the jacket, tie, and trouser type uniform that, we, that is still with us today. This photo showing the crew of Coast Guard Station Merrimack River, Massachusetts is, the, er, is in the early 1920s and illustrates this transitional period. Note the rating badges, crows, on the petty officers, the surfman cap devices, along with Coast Guard shield on the lower right sleeve. Also, as in previous photos, the keeper, a warrant officer, is in the double-breasted naval style uniform also are worn by those in the cutter branch. Chief Petty Officers would also transition to this double-breasted uniform worn by their counterparts ashore, I mean afloat, I'm sorry. This image of the crew of Station Lorraine, Wisconsin illustrates the continuing transition. Note the change in color of the cover, you know, the cap and style an inclusion of the distinctive service uh, serviceman collar and cap devices, as opposed to the hat band. 
Remember the earlier photo of the crew of Station Sturgeon Point in 1915? This image shows the crew at, at that same station in the late 1920s after the transition to the new surfman uniform. The unique Coast Guard shield worn on the right sleeve have been added to the naval style uniform worn by the Cutter Branch to distinguish enlisted Coast Guard from their Navy counterparts. This unique shield was also an essential component of the surfman uniform. The Coast Guard shield remains a point of pride on all modern day Coast Guard uniforms. The basics are set. These photos provide excellent examples of the surfman uniform of the late 1920s and early 1930s. With few minor adjustments, this uniform would be the standard into the late 1950s. If only a photo could speak. The dark blue hat cover eventually would be joined by a white cover option, and the cap device would transition from being pinned directly to the cap to being mounted on a protrusion on the hat band, much as it is today. This photo taken at Bay Shore Studio in Bay Shore, Long Island, New York, is a fascinating study on the surfman uniform and the Coast Guard of the 1930s. From what I have learned, it is a graduation photo for a training class for advancement to chief petty officer. It appears that most art bosun's mates at the time, BM, bosun mate, was a right arm rating. So you see that our chevrons are on the right arm. Although it does include at least one left arm rating, probably a motor machinist rating. Note the warrant officer, bosun W1, probably the instructor, in center of the group, behind the BM1, seated on the floor with that customary jaunty tilt of the cover that was, a, was a, a particularly proper, uh, uh, popular at the time. Another interesting aspect is the BM1 to the left of the warrant officer appears to be wearing the Chief Petty Officer L cap device, but has not yet sewn on his chief's crow. I suspect he was promoted shortly before the class. Also, the two Coasties in the naval square rig uniform at the back are probably cuttermen. If the photo could talk, I'm sure it would tell many interesting stories. As explained earlier, Chief Petty Officers in the Life Saving Branch transitioned to a double breasted jacket, identical to that worn by their Cutter Branch counterparts. However, their uniforms included the unique serpent device, adorning collar and cap. This photo of the crew of Station North Superior in Minnesota from 1935 shows two chiefs front row, second and third from the left in the double-breasted uniform. Until 1940, personnel enlisting in the Coast Guard chose either the life-saving or cutter branch. And there was very little transferring between the branches. If a surfman did request to go afloat, he faced a possible reduction in grade because of his lack of shipboard experience and expertise. He also would transition to the naval style uniform worn by the cutter branch. The same applied to a cutterman going the other way. As the service matured, there was more blending, but the life saving personnel remained fairly insular through and beyond World War II. So, what did the work uniform look like? The standard work uniform for surfmen was a very practical three button heavyweight blue jumper and matching trousers. Love the picture to the right. Note the officer in charge in the very smart blue over white rig. The surfman also had a white option for their warm weather work uniform. This image shows a boat crew from that station North Superior in the white over white. As with the slow transition, to the naval style dress uniform, surfmen would gradually transition to the dungaree work uniform that was appropriate and popular with the cutter branch. The surfman uniform becomes the basis of the World War II era 
shore establishment uniform. As the Coast Guard expanded rapidly to meet the demands placed on the service immediately before and during the U.S. entry into World War II, the shore establishment uniform came into being. It was essentially identical to the surfman uniform with the exception of the collar and cap devices. The surfman's cross doors and life ring insignia was replaced with the Coast Guard seal. Throughout the war, surfmen continued to wear their unique uniform with their very unique collar and cap devices. The vast majority of Coast Guard personnel serving were in the Naval crack, Navy Cracker Jack style uniform. However, tens of thousands of Coasties serving in the temporary reserve, as well as in other selected billets ashore, were outfitted with the new shore establishment uniform. The Coast Guard seal collar device was also used on the uniforms of the Women's Reserve, also known as SPARS. My sometimes friend and sometimes enemy, Bill Wells, a renowned Coast Guard historian, uh, indicates that um, the uniform was issued uh, to a lot of folks early on because the naval uniform uh, as production cranked up for the war was in short supply. And the shore establishment uniform because it had already been created for the surfman was actually less expensive, which makes sense for the Coast Guard and it's always tight budget. These photos of World War II era Coast Guardsmen are excellent illustrations of the, of the shore establishment uniform. As you notice on the left, that jaunty tip of the cap was apparently still very popular at the time. The photo on the left provides a clear close up view of the shore establishment uniform, as explained earlier. The surfman uniform was identical with the exception of the collar devices. Note the honorable service lapel patch, commonly known as the ruptured duck, the service personnel, service personnel over the right breast pocket. It was presented to those members of the US military who, had honor, who were honorably discharged at the end of World War II. The insignia was meant to identify personnel who had done their duty, had been processed out, and were making their way home in uniform. Beginning in the late 1930s, there was also a khaki version of the shore establishment and surfman uniform. The image on the right shows the khaki shore establishment uniform. One can imagine how that was received at the chief's mess, board cutters, or in the local enlisted men's club. I'm sure those surfmen transferring to cutters were quick to hide their khakis deep in the bottom of their sea bag. This photo shows the crew of Station Amagansett, New York, in surfman uniform sometime during World War II. The photo probably was taken as the crew prepared for beach patrol or beach patrol train. The surfman's traditional patrol of the beaches to watch for mariners in distress took on new emphasis as the threat of landing of enemy saboteurs and spies became a real possibility. Station Amagansett became famous in the media when seaman John Cullen discovered German spies landing on the beach on June the 13th, 1942. In June of 1942, the Coast Guard Auxiliary and Reserve Act was amended, authorizing the enrollment of temporary members of the Coast Guard Reserve for intermittent part-time duty. A new, unique category of Coast Guardsmen was born, the United States Coast Guard Reserve Temporary, popularly known as TRs. In addition to a wide variety of personnel serving in specialized shore billets, these new reservists would dramatically expand those serving in the shore establishment uniform. The next few images pay tribute to the many, many World War II era Coasties who served proudly in that uniform.
In areas near significant population centers, TRs handled much of the duties of the famous Coast Guard Beach Patrol. Note the amount of patrolmen in the upper right. This khaki undress uniform was also a mainstay of surf as well as the auxiliary. This image on the left, Beach Patrol Farrier working on one of the horses and a canine friend. And to the right, a weapons instructor. Note the farrier's mix of watch sweater, dungarees, and a shore establishment cover. This is an image of the war, a photo, or a newspaper image of the World War II era of Washington, D.C. Volunteer Port Security Force, TR. The Volunteer Port Security Force organization was a regiment. They are all in formation in that aforementioned khaki uniform. What is interesting, and it's difficult to tell from this newspaper photo, it appears that they have the women in the unit mustered front and center, and it's a very limited number, in front of whoever is in command. One of the intriguing things is the women in the temporary reserve were not technically spars. Um, they were U.S. Coast Guard Reserve temporary female. So it, it, uh, it, there's two distinctive things. And there, if you, I've read anecdotal anecdotal information that uh, spars and the TR women mm, sometimes didn't get along as well as possibly they should have. This is the temporary reserve band, a flotilla 504. Other than the volunteer port security force regiments, flotilla was the primary unit level organization of the reserve temporary the TR. This grew out of its close association with the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Most TR flotillas either formed around an existing uh, auxiliary flotilla or were created, especially in the first and third districts, first and third naval districts, as a new flotilla, but still somewhat loosely associated with the auxiliary. But one should never confuse Auxiliary and TR. The TRs were military personnel. The auxiliary, even throughout the war, were uniformed civilian. This is one of my favorite photos. The Temporary Reserve Flotilla 412 Pipe Band, known as the Kilties, out of Winthrop, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. This is a great illustration of creativity with the Coast Guard uniform blended with uh, kilts and other adornments that go along with the Scottish tradition. The Coast Guard pipe band continu continues this tradition. This is their heritage. A couple more of my favorite shore establishment uniform photos. While obviously a staged public relations photo on the left, I sure wouldn't want to screw with those temporary reservists from Volunteer Port Security Force Detroit. Those are pretty impressive machines. The photo on the right is Robert Resnick in, in 1941. If you don't look close, I would challenge all but the most attentive Coasties to discern that this was a World War II era, not modern day Coast Guard uniform. Patriotism was at a high point in World War II. There was tremendous motivation to be part of the fight. Those who were either too old or somehow ineligible for regular service or were designated for specific defense department or defense support job, jobs in, in factories and shipyards and all that were, kind of, were prohibited from going into the, the service. They still wanted to do their part. The opportunity to wear the Coast Guard uniform and do their part was a tremendous motivation and a highly successful recruiting tool for the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard Auxiliary Uniform. 
born in 1939, the auxiliary would also be influenced by both the surfman and shore establishment uniform. Essentially, the auxiliary uniform was the surfman slash shore establishment uniform with different patches and cap devices. Many World War II auxiliaries were also temporary reservists simultaneously. I have little doubt that when appropriate, they would have rather donned their TR uniform and certainly regretted giving up those rating badges at war's end and that overt military status. The surfman style uniform was not unfamiliar to Carter. Long before the combining of the two services, cooks, mess attendants, and stewards wore a similar uniform. This image of the famous Cutter Bear in, in 1895 shows officers, cooks, messmen, and stewards in the front row in a uniform nearly identical to the early surfman. This cropped image from the previous photo shows greater detail. This tradition would continue for decades. This World War II era photo shows Coasties from a cutter who had successfully completed a convoy escort across the Atlantic in Scotland, waiting for an opportunity for a phone call home. Those in that distinctive uniform that looks very much like the surfman's uniform are the cooks, stewards, and mess attendants. The insert illustrates the unique cover that they wore. Personally, I wonder what impact this separate uniform for certain Coasties may have had on the resistance to acceptance of the modern day uniform. As more and more Coasties transition to the naval style uniform, the surfman uniform would begin to fade. Its derivative, the shore establishment uniform and the uniform worn by messmen and stewards also gradually disappeared after World War II. However, those entitled to wear the surfman uniform and carry the L behind their rating will continue to do so with pride. Master Chief Bill McCarran, US Coast Guard retired, reports that he knew a Bozemate first class L, an Ingeman first class L, who still wore their surfman uniform into the early 1960s. From this and other anecdotal information, it appears that the ability to wear as long as serviceable allowed surfmen to wear their unique uniforms carefully for decades. No matter the uniform, and this is a motley looking crew, I confess, by the end of World War II, Coasties were cementing the unique culture that would make them members of a service honored and respected in peace and in war throughout the world. Those last words are an excerpt from the Creed of the United States Coast Guards, authored in 1938. The journey to one Coast Guard was well underway. In 1970, then Commandant Admiral Chester Bender proposed that the Coast Guard adopt a uniform distinctly different from that of the Navy. The Navy was going through uniform changes of its own and Admiral Bender believed the time was right for a transition to a new unique Coast Guard uniform. He hoped it would solidify visually the Coast Guard status as a unique branch of the United States Armed Forces rather than a smaller version of the Navy. Admiral Bender and others also felt that the appearance for appearance wise the enlisted naval style uniform visually distracted from the authority of petty officers engaged in law enforcement duties, which rapidly were becoming an increasingly important part of the Coast Guard mission set. Board was established to explore possibilities and proposed a style for the new uniform. It was very similar to that of the surfman uniform. A distinctive Coast Guard blue color different from that of any other military government service was suggested by the Army's Natick Research Laboratory. Transition to the new uniform, while not necessarily popular, began in 1972. While forever known as the Bender Blues, 
the Master Chief Petty Officer, the first Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard of the United States, Charles Calhoun, deserves much credit. In the way of Master Chiefs, he truly led the charge. No easy thing. Note that the transition also included creation of a unique rating symbol on the right, the Coast Guard shield for the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. This is now the standard for gold badge command Master Chiefs throughout the service. The Coast Guard has now been in Bender Blues for nearly 50 years, by far the longest time that the entire service has been in the same uniform. Like many things in Coast Guard history, the surfman uniform and its role as the inspiration for the modern day uniform has faded somewhat from our collective memory. Many Coast Guard serving both today and at the time of the transition have no knowledge of the connection. One wonders if the attitudes and opinions of those serving during the change might have been different if that history had been more of a focus during the transition. And I can tell you personally, I lived through that transition. As those Coast Guard veterans entitled to the L designation and the wearing of the surfman uniform continue to fade away, the collective memory of its history will only become more obscure. This is not a good thing. Pride in uniform is essential to any military service anywhere. Be proud of your uniforms, Coasties. It has history. For those interested, many of the images included in tonight's presentation are available in an article in the historical documents section of the Coast Guard Historian's website. Simply do a search for surfman uniform under the subject. The link is also included at the bottom. That concludes my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Bob. That was a great presentation. I thought I'll go ahead and start. First question is the, uh, you mentioned right arm and left arm. Can you tell us a little bit about what the difference is between the two? Sure. In the, in the beginning, they, they called them the seaman ratings, uh, and they were the traditional ratings of uh, uh, bosun mate, quartermaster, gunner's mate. I'm sure I'm forgetting some that somebody will remind me of. But anyway, they were the traditional seaman ratings. And then they had the artisan ratings, uh, which is damage controlman and uh, pattern maker and motor machinist and all those, they were left-hand ratings. But, so, but the right-hand right hand ratings were the traditional sort of command ratings, um, you know, of, of the time period. And eventually decided to like, you know, switch switch to all, all left-hand ratings. Uh, but uh, it was those seaman ratings, those traditional ratings that were, you know, dated back to the, uh, to the days of sale that would, would be included on the right hand. I'm just trying to think of them all off the top of my head, but I, I can't come up with them. I know, I know Bosa made, Gunners made, Quartermaster, hmm, as there's a couple more, but they're not, they're not popping into my head, so. So I'm also looking at the picture right now of the Pea Island Station, and I see the uh, two gentlemen on the left have some lined uh, stripes on their sleeve. What does that mean? Well, the traditional, the, the service stripe, which was kind of a, a military tradition, would come over into that life-saving service uh, shore establishment uniform. And so each of one of those stripes, at, at one point, at one point they started out, it was indi indicative of, for the for the surfman, it was a, indicative, I think, of like two years service or three years service. And eventually it would progress to where each of those stripes indicated a uh, service of four years. So you can see the gentleman is basically the XPO there, the, the the second in charge, and the number of stripes. You add that baby up, and uh, you know this guy had been serving uh, either in the uh, life saving service of the Coast Guard for for decades. And so um, the other one is, it, 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 you can see that his cap devices still carry the surfman uh, cap device, but uh, eventually, as they made these transitions, especially during the World War II period. Uh, some of them would fade away where they weren't wearing the, the uh, lapel device, um, but that was uh, a mainstay on the, uh, on the uh, shore establishment uniform. So uh, 
Um, and who knows, this, this could have been one of those space, uh, stage photos where the photographer thought it was better without, who knows. <laughs> All right, well, we have a manageable crowd here, so everybody should be able to unmute themselves if you'd like to go ahead and ask a question. Hey, I'll turn Bob, it over to the audience. Bob, this is Mark Snell. Hi, Mark. Hey, how are you doing? Could you go back right. to that picture of the marching band? Sure, hang on a second. The Kilties or the, no, the the band? There, there. That one. Yeah. Is that a is that a woman as the drum major in the front? Yes. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Um. So when the band started getting created, you got the drum major who's a woman, and then you have the basically the band master. You see, it's like either an Anson or a JG. It's hard to hard to discern. But uh, so. During World War II, um, you know, there was a demand for parades uh, for bo uh, bond war bond raising events and, you know, all of those kinds of things. And of course, uh, uh, the regular Coasties have headed off to headed off to war. They're, you know, they're, in, they're invading places on landing craft and going to sea. And uh, so the, the, the temporary reserve flotillas really stepped up. And when they would form these bands, it would be kind of, you know, volunteer people with musical talents or whatever. But there are several instances where they would recruit a, a renowned musician, uh, uh, orchestra director, or uh, uh, some such individual with uh, you know tremendous talent, uh, and they would enroll them into the temporary reserve, and that was basically their only gig, right? They were they were there to basically direct and organize the bands. But these these guys that are all standing in formation here, and most of them are also, uh, you know, instead of instead of you know, in addition to going to parades, are also like manning small boats, doing port security stuff, or doing beach patrol. So, um, you know, this was a, this was a side gig. It was a it was a collateral duty, with you know a couple of exceptions where you have uh, folks, and they they were really successful in recruiting incredible uh, professional musicians. I've read about the. the you know, the one band out of Boston was like, you know, it rivaled the full-time uh, Coast Guard regular bands who were wholly made up of people that they had recruited as professional musicians. So, yeah. And again, if you, uh, uh, you know, if you read about the whole, I mean, I'm, I'm just starting to research the relationship between the SPARs and the temporary reserve women and that they weren't considered SPARs by the SPARs. But they were obviously wholly accepted by the by the other temporary service. Could you go to that picture also back to Washington D.C.? That one? Yeah. Is is that Washington Navy Yard? Do you know where that location is? I do not know. I mean, I have to go back and look. I you know I pulled this photograph. It's a it's a, uh, a newspaper photograph. Um, I so I I'm not sure about the I'm not sure about the location. Um, you know, they would do whole unit, whole regiment musters, um, you know, for for whatever occasion, award ceremonies and and those kinds of things. So I don't know. I do not know the location of this one. Each of the each of the um, volunteer port security force units typically has some sort of a barracks. Now, it could, could be on a naval base, could be on a Coast Guard base, could be anything. So it's completely possible that this is the Navy Yard. Thanks. Great questions. So maybe I could call upon Mass Chief uh, Vince Patton. Um, in the loop we had of history questions, we talked a little bit about the, the uniform board and uh, some of the factors that go into that. I believe as Mass Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, you were involved with the uniform board, correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. In fact, uh, during my time, actually it was before me, Master Chief number seven, Rick Trent, uh, when he uh, during his time as Master Chief of the Coast Guard, and then Kerry Ford, the uh, the head of the uniform board became the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, which which I thought was quite uh, interesting. And, and as Bob pointed out here, particularly with this slide, that uh, uh, Charlie Calhoun, the first Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, you know, truly was the guy that spearheaded the Bender Blues. And I've often wondered why did they call it the Bender Blues, other than the fact that. Bender being the commandant at the time, but uh, you know I've yet to find a uniform with Bender wearing it. Uh, uh, as you saw in that picture, when uh, Calhoun, uh, you know, that picture was taken in um, in 1972, January 72, where he was standing with his uh, 
his his admin assistant, uh, senior chief uh, uh, Mason. So that shows you how early that was, and uh, and for quite a while, and and knowing uh, Mass Chief Calhoun personally, and and I was fascinated with having this conversation with him because um, I personally have, have, have felt to credit him as the one that actually pushed this uniform, uh, and I, I think it just got the name Bender Blues by virtue of the commandant, but. It was Charlie Calhoun for a couple of reasons. One is when Calhoun came into the Coast Guard at, right after World War II, uh, he was, he, his first assignment was, uh, was Station Ocean City, which was his hometown. And uh, at that time, just as Bob mentioned, there was this transition of wearing the surfman uniform to moving into the, the, uh, the Navy style uniform. And uh, he wanted to be issued the surfman uniform. They wouldn't give it to him because he came in from the Navy, says, you got your uniforms, we're not gonna buy you anymore. And, uh, and, and it kind of bothered him the whole time because he always wanted to wear the surfman uniform. So uh, when he became Master Chief of the Coast Guard and the Commandant brought up the question, how can we can become more distinctive than the Navy, because the Commandant, uh, Admiral Bender, uh, actually, actually it was Admiral Willard Smith when Calhoun became Mass Chief of the Coast Guard, but that, but that was only for a year. And then uh, Bender came right after that, the following year in, um, in 1970. So it was that, that time that Calhoun sort of politic with Bender, who also wanted to have some distinctive look of the Coast Guard. Uh, but he didn't quite know where to go. Calhoun's the one that said, let's do this. So I've, I, I've often said in, in many crowds I talk to that Calhoun is actually the deserving person that uh, was the guy that actually spearheaded this uniform. And the Coast Guard has recently honored Master Chief Calhoun by naming the 10th National Security Cutter after him, which I think they, uh, splashed in April earlier this spring. Uh, that is correct. And the commissioning will be sometime in March, April of next year. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions? Not so much a question, it's just like talking about it. It's like, um, you know, I was a young second class damage control when we went through this transition. And uh, I've been stationed uh, uh, aboard the Coast Guard Cutter Mesquite when I was at DC-3 and uh, I had a good buddy on the ship who was from a long line of long line of surfmen and uh, he in the Great Lakes region and uh, he had uh, essentially the stations would have a, for lack a cruise book or a, a yearbook that covered a particular you know year or a couple years of the service of the station and uh, you know and it, these his relatives had served in the 1930s so I'd seen the surfman uniform. I understood, uh, you know, the, this, the, the little bit of the history of this uniform. And it always kind of astounded me a little bit when we were going through this transition that, you know, at the time that we entered the transition, I'm a, a DC-2 aboard a river tender in Omaha, Nebraska, but there was nobody else on that, on that cutter who had any knowledge of that uniform. No idea, you know? So, yeah, I mean, you know, I've always, and, and of course it's a different time period. Um, we're post Vietnam, we're trying to do some transitions here a little bit, or at least closing in on the end of Vietnam. Why they didn't play on the history a little more, maybe it would have been more palatable for some of these guys that were really attached to the, to the old Cracker Jacks. You know, I, I chime in here real quick, uh, Bob, because as I talked to, uh, to Charlie about this, because uh, uh, yeah, this was a, this was an uphill battle because the, uh, the Cracker Jack uniform, and, and also also remember, you know, the Chiefs weren't too thrilled about this because it meant doing away with uh, with khaki uniforms. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so Charlie Calhoun had an uphill battle during his tenure of uh, pushing this uniform. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that argument before. I mean, it's, it, again, at the same kind of time, even, you know, I mean, I wasn't close to the Chiefs mess yet, yet at that point, but, uh, you know, the whole thing about the khakis and, uh, you know, one, one of the things that, hey, you guys know that like the, 
you know, E4s used to wear khakis, you know, and they're like, what? You know, and uh, the other one is like, you know, the Naval Services, us and the Navy were the only uniform branch that weren't, ha didn't have everybody from in the same uniform from E1 to E10, right? I mean, it was the Navy and the, the Coast Guard were kind of standouts. And we went over to a similar, you know, or to have the same uniform basically from E1 to, 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 to E10, which is, like the Air Force and the Marine Corps and the Army and everybody else. And, uh, you know, the, the Navy started that and retreated, which is kind of interesting as well. Hey, Bob, this is Mark again. Um, I just did a little research on Chet Bender. Turns out he suggested this uniform um, when he was on the staff of Admiral Smith, Commandant Willard Smith. And Smith blew him off because he didn't want to change. And none of the senior officers wanted to change, but apparently he wanted to do this to give more of an authority looking um, image to the E4s, 5s, and 6s, especially those who had law enforcement responsibilities. So when he became commandant, he passed this on to, the, uh, to his right hand man, which is pretty similar in all the services, you know, in, in the Air Force, you know, in the Marines and the Army. It's always like the Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. They're the ones who drive, just like Vince did. They're the ones who drive the uniform changes because they've got to, they're the ones that have to solicit the entire enlisted force. And whatever they come up with, the officer corps, for the most part, doesn't have a choice in, in the matter, even though they have to buy their own uniform. So uh, that's where it was with, with Bender. You're, you're right, Vince. He turned it over to his right hand man to push it through but it was his idea dating back to the late 1960s. And it came down to that Navy Marine Corps, a Navy Coast Guard rivalry, not knowing the difference between a Coast Guardsman and uh, Naval personnel. Yeah, as I said in the, as I said in the presentation, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a big motivation. It's like all of a sudden, I mean, we've always done law enforcement. We've always done law enforcement since the, since the days of the, you know, the Revenue Cutter Services, you know, <laughs> first boarding, uh, and of course, uh, prohibition was a big part of that. But uh, you know, if you look at prohibition, there were there were folks on small boats out of stations doing uh, law enforcement boardings, and they were doing them in the in the it, you know at that point the traditional surfing uniform. So yeah, it's kind of, you know it's kind of interesting if you're you know the guy who goes over the gunnel today uh, looks more uh, like a um, you know someone who me means business and that, that was what he was that's what he was looking for so i have a question is the donna v listed on my attendees list here the donna who's my most favorite spar expert yes but um yes <laughs> can you hear me i can so um this this presentation was geared towards uh males because up until the spars that really was the uh the situation the first women enlisted uh crafted their own uniforms for lack of a better thing uh could you offer any input about uh, the women's spar uniforms and how that came about well uh, that's, that's really interesting that you uh, asked me that question because just today i was at the state historical society in washington dropping off a spar officers uniforms and i hadn't looked at them before i gave them to the the museum and there were things in there I'd never seen before but um, I know I'm going to butcher the name but uh, the designer of the uniform I think it's pronounced man I, I could be wrong about that um, if you're asking for more information other than that I, I, this is really on the spot and I'm I'm in a car driving I'm no I'm not driving <laughs> I'm a passenger but at the same time I'm really not prepared to talk about that right now, but um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so hey, Donna, I want to thank you because, you know, like I said, you and I've gone back and forth and I had no, I, I, I mean, I've been trying to lock down the, the relationship between the, the spars and those women who belong to the temporary reserve because, you know, as you know, the TR is kind of a passion for me. So uh, I want to thank you for like getting me off in the right direction because I've discovered other things since then. So thanks. Yeah, I would like to find out who the lady, the aunt photo, 
the drum major. I, I've never seen that before. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, she's a TR. I pulled that from I pulled that from a book. I have the book. I can uh, I can see if I can pin that down. Great. That's one of the uh, interesting things about these presentations and the discussion is uh, linking researchers up together. So we'll follow up on that one. Does anyone else have any questions before we conclude for the evening? I got one last thing, and this is. Uh, you know, when we talk about the separation of the two organizations or two branches under the under the Coast Guard banner, uh, as we're ramping up toward, um, you know, the, the creation of the Coast Guard, if you will, with all the discussions that are going on in May 1st of 1914. So, you know, we're we're looming ahead of the 1915 creation of the Coast Guard and the, the creation of the two organizations. Uh, you know, Admiral Bertoff said, you understand going to sea is different than living on the beach. A man be the best surfman in the world, and not a sailor. And the reverse is very true. So it's like, you know, they understood that uh, they had some, they had some blending to overcome in 1914. Mm. All right, well, with that, um, when I do the post production, I will post this to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find our YouTube channel by going to YouTube and simply searching for Foundation for Coast Guard History. And then our next presentation will be Tuesday, October 4th. Uh, topic to be determined, but we will have a topic, don't worry. Um, so with that, uh, I thank everybody for their participation tonight and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>